All right, guys. We had our first exam the other day. Um, what I always like to do after an exam is I always like to go through and um, make a video where I kind of proof the exam. So the scores that you see on your grade book right now, those might change in the event that I find a, an error in the, in the grading. Um, you don't have to do anything about that, but that's why right now you shouldn't be able to see the correct answers marked off. I like to make a video where I kind of walk through question by question. Um, so that's going to be happening in the next few days. I'm hoping to have that by the end of the weekend. Um, but as soon as I get that posted, I'll let you guys know. Now, with that said, we've got a new block of material that we're going to be talking about. And so I, I need to post this PowerPoint and the rest of those PowerPoints until our next exam. Those will be posted um, again before the end of the weekend. One thing that I am going to make a change on for this first or for our second exam and all exams moving forward is the window is not going to be open until 11 p.m. because then I had people who were running into problems as as late as like 11 as you know as late as 10 p.m. and you know that's that's something to like kind of it's tough to wrangle with I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and open the exam um at that would be 9.30, so 30 minutes before our class starts. Sorry, just a second. And then, um, so 9.30 a.m. until about 4 p.m. So that's the window that's going to be open. Um, so I'm going to shrink that down a little bit. Now, with that in mind, one thing that I want to say regarding your exam and grading of the exam. Um, in the grade book, you'll soon see, if you haven't already, you'll see things like X1, and then exam one, take two, and then exam one, take three. Well, okay. Do you remember you talking about posting our index plus the canvas? So um, I got an email, I got a message about posting the index cards to Canvas. Don't worry about that for this time. So I apologize for that. There's no need to worry about that this time. Um, so in the grade book, you'll either either you already see or you will see exam one, exam two, exam one, take two, exam one, take three. Um, exam one, take two is the grade that you're going to get on your exam two. So I'll just label this as EX2. And then exam one, take three is your final exam score. Now, what this is going to be, and I, I mentioned this in the syllabus, but let's say that you got a 76 because it was you know, 25 questions, four points a piece. You got a 76 on the first exam. Well, maybe on exam two, you get an 80. And then on the final exam, let's say you get a 72 or something like that. Um, your grade calculation for, um, you know, exam one is, I think, 15% or 12 and a half percent. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this in this grade. And this is what's going to be basically the, I think it's 12.5% of your grade for exam one. So essentially what that means is, you know, to do really well in this class, you can do really well in the final exam because if you got a 76 on the first exam and then an 80 on the second exam, then you got a 92 on the final, well, that final is going to replace all your other exams. Now, if you want to talk about this later, I'm more than happy to talk about this individually. This is something that it, it sometimes gets a little bit confused and muddied. So, you know, let's just go ahead. If you've got questions about the grading, um, in a general sense, your next exam can replace the exam score that you just got. So exam two can replace one, three can replace two, four can replace three, and so on. This is, this is opening Thursday. No, we, this is not an exam opening Thursday morning. We do not have an exam Thursday morning. Um, so our higher exam replaced every, or our higher grade replaces every exam. Like I said, exam two can replace one. Three can replace two. 
four can replace three if it's higher. Four will not replace one. Okay, so like I said, if you want to talk about this individually, we can go through that and I can give you some, you know, I can basically list out all your grades. Um, I've already mentioned the note cards. Please do not worry about turning in the note cards. Okay, so here we go. Now what we're going to be talking about is ions. But before we do that, let's go ahead and tackle a poll question. Oh, I gave you five options, but there's actually only four. So which is a metal? Carbon, lead, both, neither? Spoiler alert, E is not the correct answer. And another, another spoiler, um, one of them is. Oh, I shouldn't have said it. I can give about five more seconds. I think we can get to 45, 41, 42, 43, 44, done. We got it, 45. Okay, everybody, the correct answer is B, lead. Um, I, I don't know how to answer it on your phone. I think you tap the screen and then it, it toggles around with, here's the survey. So lead, you're absolutely right. Lead is a metal. Now, carbon's kind of interesting because carbon does have some properties that make it similar to a metal, but in terms of where, it's on the period, where it is on the periodic table, carbon is a non-metal. Now, oh, okay, great. So we can do what's called a conductivity test and see that. So here what we have is a conductivity test where we've got a battery or an electrical source right here. It looks like a D cell battery. And we try to send that electric current. That's a great point. I just remember carbon dioxide and it helps me remember carbon as a metal. That's a great uh, thank you very much for sharing that, Christian. That's a great reminder. Um, so here what we have is an electric current that's going through this graphite, and that graphite's going to help send it on to this light bulb. And if that light lights up, well, then you've got some ability to conduct electricity. Now, as we talked about with our, what was the, the term for substances that have properties of metals and non-metals? Does anyone remember that? Add it to the chat or say it aloud. I remember that one. Metalloids, perfect. I like those because they sound like you know aliens from a, a really poorly written movie. Um, so yeah, those are substances that have properties of metals and non-metals. Carbon isn't a metalloid, but it's very close to the metalloids on the period on the periodic table. Aluminum. If we compare, here's our graphite illuminated light, and here's our aluminum. Well, that aluminum lights up brightly. I was going to use an analogy or say something. Oh, it lights up like a, well, it lights up like a light. It's a very strong conductor. So aluminum here helps that electric current move very quickly. And it doesn't really have anything to do with, you know, the size or the shape of that aluminum versus the graphite. It's the material itself that is sending or not sending that electric current or allowing or not allowing that current to flow through. Now, just as a little bit of a review, Here's our periodic table. And you guys had the periodic table on, on your exam, and I'm going to use that same periodic table through the remainder of the semester. This is a good way that we can remember the number of valence electrons that an element has. So everything in the first row has one valence electron. The second row has two valence electrons. The third has three, four, five, six, seven, and eight valence electrons. Does that mean the total number of electrons? No, it doesn't. It, valence electrons, what are, can anyone add to the chat, um, you know, like a, a brief description, like what are the valence electrons? Maybe as a little bit of a clue, where are they? The outer electrons, Christian, fantastic. Those are our outermost electrons. And so what that means is if you take something like, let's say oxygen, Oxygen has a total of eight electrons. Six of them are its outermost valence electrons. The other two are kind of its core electrons. 
Now, the same thing goes for something like selenium. Selenium has a total of 34 electrons, but only six of them are their valence electrons. So that means it's got 28 kind of core electrons. Now, with that, this is kind of where we're going to be. This information right here is going to be very helpful, helpful for how we move forward because what we're going to do with those valence electrons is we're going to draw a representation of an element. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to look at, and I'm going to ask you to remember these, how many valence electrons does aluminum have? Add that to the chat. That's right. Aluminum has three valence electrons. Now, how many valence electrons does phosphorus have? Absolutely right. It's got five valence electrons. Now, total number of electrons vary considerably, but our, our um, valence are three and five, respectively. Okay. Now, what we're going to use this information for is to draw these molecules. And whenever we draw these, we're going to do what's known as a Lewis dot structure or a Lewis dot symbol. This is, you know, whenever you see a molecule like CH4 or something like this, H, H, H. I remember whenever I took my first chemistry class, I was like, ooh, I can draw this molecule. That means I'm smart. Got it. That's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be drawing molecules and drawing atoms and looking at the electrons that are important for them bonding. So as an example, if we take aluminum, what we always want to do is we want to write the symbol, Al, Al. Aluminum symbol is Al. Aluminum has three valence electrons. So the great thing about drawing the valence structure for or drawing the Lewis symbol for aluminum is we account for our three valence electrons. And then we start, I always kind of start at the nine o'clock position. So to the left, I'm thinking of like the clock, a uh, face of a clock. 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Done. And I think that, you know, that's that's the end goal. But sometimes what you'll do is you'll start on the right, left, top. Okay. And this is important whenever you have fewer electrons and everything like that. Now, phosphorus. How many? Oh, I see Gabriel added most recently that phosphorus has five valence electrons. So when we draw phosphorus, we're going to start out one, two, three, four, five. Done. We've got our five valence electrons drawn there. Okay, so basically whenever you're drawing a Lewis symbol, what you have to think of first is what is the, what is the symbol? What are the letters that make up the, the symbol for that element? P for phosphorus, AL for aluminum. Good. Now... Here are the Lewis dot symbols for all of our main group elements. Our main group elements, let's look at this. Groups one and two, and then three A through eight. So I'm gonna you know, take a mental snapshot of this for a moment. Click, now I'm gonna go back to the periodic table. Our main group elements this group right here, and most of those groups right here. Now, just as a little bit of a review, does anyone remember the blocks? The S, D, P, F. Which blocks did I just circle? The S and the P block. Perfect. Great job, everyone. I, I like to kind of embed those review reminder sorts of questions. So those are S and P blocks. Okay. Now, here what we've got is a Zoom question. How many dots surround B in the Lewis dot symbol for boron? Launch my poll question. Again, oops, I, I gave you five answer options. Okay. 
One person has answered. One person. Very well done. So how many dots? I can give you about 20 seconds after that. So that'll be about 40 seconds total. We got 16 answers. And I know that I didn't post this PowerPoint, but you could use the ptable.com or the periodic table. Just Google that. Okay. Okay, fine. I'm, I'm a little bit of a softie. I can give you five more seconds. Because I really like to get us to about 40 answers. Because that's like a third of our classes enrolled. We got 38 right now. Two more people. Come on, folks. And done. Okay. Now here, we have four answer options. And let me just say, nobody answered E. Awesome. The most popular answer was B. Or, well, or boron. That's just a coincidence, I have to let you know. Well, here we jump back. How many dots does B have? It's got three. Boron is in the same row as aluminum, or in the same column, sorry. The column columns go up and down, just like on a house. It's the same as boron, so we're good there. That's perfect. Well done. Okay. Now, all of this with drawing Lewis dot symbols, what we're trying to do is we're trying to follow something known as the octet rule. The octet rule basically says, and actually, you know, let's think about this. Let's let's put A L. Or you no, know, let's go with let's look at our Lewis symbols of our noble gases. How many dots does neon have N E? How many dots does neon have around it? Eight. Neon with eight dots around it. And all of your other noble gases, except for helium, all of those noble gases are happy. That that term noble gas, for some reason, I always think of like, a, I don't know, like a, the animated Robin Hood cartoon from when I was a kid. Um, I think of like Friar Tuck as being noble and happy. Um, those noble gases are happy. They're not reactive. They don't like to share electrons or anything. They're, you know, Helium gas, neon gas, argon gas. Well, those exist as individual atoms because they are good to go. They have the exact number of electrons that they want to. So they don't need to seek someone else out to get those electrons or to borrow those electrons from them. So I always kind of think about those as my reference points for my octet rule. The octet rule states that atoms tend to gain, lose, or share electrons until they have eight valence electrons. How many valence electrons do all of our noble gases, except for helium, have? They've got eight. They're happy. Do they need to share electrons to be happy? No. They are, they're isolated. They're good. They don't need to share any electrons. Okay. Now, if we look at something like sodium chloride, table salt, NaCl, Na, sodium, has one valence electron. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. Well, sodium chloride is a pretty common thing. It's your table salt. You use that to, you know, make a steak taste better. Or some people put it in your coffee. Well, Sodium, with its one valence electron, likes to lose that valence electron and ultimately get to that right there. How many electrons, how many dots are around that chlorine? Chlorine that eight has eight electrons around it, but what else does it have? It's got a negative symbol. That's interesting. That's that's peculiar. But let's think about this for a second. What is the charge of a single electron? It's negative. So we know right over here, I'm going to do some erasing. Our chlorine starts out with seven electrons. How many protons does that chlorine have? It's got seven protons. 
sorry, it has chlorine has an equal number of protons and electrons, but then sodium gives it one electron. Now all of a sudden it has an overall negative charge because it's taken on one extra electron. Okay, sodium by comparison. Well, over here, sodium has an equal number of protons and electrons. It has an overall zero charge. But when it gives up an electron, now all of a sudden it has a positive charge because its number of protons is larger than its number of electrons. So that's how we arrive at these overall different charges because sodium gives up an electron and chlorine accepts that electron. Now, when we look at this, here's kind of the, the overall accounting of it. Sodium, an atom of sodium has 11 protons total and 11 electrons. How many of these electrons are valence? It has one valence electron. Sodium, what is known as an ion, has 11 protons and 10 electrons. So this sodium ion is what results when sodium gives up one electron. How many valence electrons does, well, sodium have? It's outermost electrons, okay? Well, it's given up one, and this is, this is kind of wonky, and this is kind of crazy, but it now has eight valence electrons. Not zero, like you might expect, but eight. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But then we've got chlorine, an atom of chlorine. 17 protons, 17 electrons. An ion of chlorine has accepted one electron. Now it has a total of 18 electrons. So how many valence electrons does a chlorine atom have? Seven. How many valence electrons does a chlorine ion have? Go ahead and add to the chat how many, what number should I write right here? Eight, you're absolutely right, Taryn. It has eight valence electrons because it accepted one. Where did it, it accept one from? Where did that eighth electron come from? From sodium, perfect. That's absolutely right. So sodium gave up, a, an atom of sodium gave up one electron, making a sodium ion. A chlorine atom accepted that electron, making a chlorine ion. Okay, so this is a great example of what's taking place. Now here what we have is, I'm gonna open this poll in just a minute, and it definitely has more than three answer options. You only have three actual answer options. But let's look at this. Let's actually, we won't do the tool, poll. We'll just kind of, nope, never mind. Scratch that. We're going to do the poll. What does this represent? Protons. Okay, somebody answered immediately. Two people answered immediately. There's no, no D or E, so please don't answer that. A, B, or C. What does this image represent? For those of you who might be like accounting majors or something like that, or a business major, this is really just an exercise in accounting. It's almost like, or I like to think about this as accounting. It's just using a different... Um, a different currency. We're not talking about dollars. We're talking about protons, electrons, and neutrons. Um, I got 44 responses. 45 were done. No, I got 46. Okay. The most popular answer was B, and that is the correct answer. Now I'm going to stop the share of this. So if you answered A or C, that is incorrect. I'm going to... Okay, so now let's take in the, the account. We've got this legend up here. Protons are these orange balls. So what's the charge on a proton? It's positive. So I'm going to write positive right here, here, here. So I've got three positive charges. Neutrons, they're gray balls. Here, I don't really care about those. I'm not going to write anything on them because neutrons, what is the charge of a neutron? Zero. So we've got positive, neutral, 
and then electrons have a negative charge. Now, when it comes to electrons having a negative charge, boom, boom. Well, here's where it gets to accounting. We have three protons, plus, plus, plus. One, two electrons. These effectively cancel one another out. They'll cancel out what's left, a single positive charge. So that's why we have this as what's known as a positive ion. I like to use lithium for this as an example because it's a simple atom. In addition to that, lithium's a song. That, does anybody know who that song is by? Add it to the chat. Okay, well, it's by the band Nirvana. Anyway, let me proceed from there. Okay, so this entire conversation that we're having is all about atoms versus ions. What's the difference between an atom and an ion? I always like to think about ions as being similar to isotopes, because if you remember isotopes, isotopes were the things that were the atoms are the same, but the different, the, what differs is the number of neutrons. So they have different, oh, uh, Blake, good, yeah, close, close. You're like 33% correct there. Um, so, but thank you. Um, so an isotope, I'm gonna say versus isotopes. We include that here as well. An atom is kind of like your base model. An atom has the same number of protons and neutrons, or sorry, protons and electrons. So a neutral atom has an equal number of protons and electrons. Positive charges and negative charges cancel one another out. Positive ions. Well, in order to form a positive ion, you have to lose electrons. A positive ion has more protons than electrons. What about negative ion? A negative ion gains electrons. So how does that happen? Well, it, it takes one on, like what we saw back here. Chlorine, a chlorine atom, accepts an electron to make a chlorine or a chloride ion. A negative ion has more electrons than protons, okay? So that's what we're looking at, protons and electrons. When we're talking about atoms and ions, you're talking only about protons and electrons, okay? Now I'm gonna come down here and I say atoms versus um, isotopes. When we're talking about isotopes, we're actually not talking about Electrons, we're talking about protons and neutrons. I bring this up just because people have a, I know that I personally struggled with this where I get these things mixed up. Think about your three subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Well, ions are concerned only with protons and electrons. Isotopes are concerned with protons and neutrons only. Okay. So keep that in mind and remember that for moving forward. Okay, now we've got another poll that I'd like to do. I'm gonna go over here. Got four answer options. How many dots surround BR in the Lewis dot symbol for BR minus? Okay, now if you haven't answered this yet, well, how BR minus, is that negative important? Spoiler, yes it is. Okay, the first person who answered after I said yes it is, correct. Let's see if the correct answer is gonna overtake the incorrect answer. Oh, it's, it's a dead heat. I think we can get to 50 answers, 50 responses. We got 68 people here. Oh boy, they're neck and neck. Same number of incorrect and correct. Yes. Our correct answers just overtook. Oh, celebrated too early. 
to steal a line from Bane in uh, the Batman movie, Victory Has Weakened Me. I, I celebrated too early. Okay, we got 10 more. Come on, folks. Okay, I'm just now I'm just going to aim for 45. So I need five more people, four more people. Come on, come on, you can do it. I know that you're thinking about this one, everyone. Okay, I'm, now I'm just going to give you five more seconds. And done. Okay, I'm happy I stopped when I did. Because whenever I stopped, the most popular answer was C. Okay, now I'm going to jog back a little bit. Here we go. Add to the chat, what's the charge of this that I just circled? Does it have a charge? Is it positive, negative? Okay, I got one vote for positive. I'm looking for positive, negative, or neutral. Okay, I got another positive. I'm getting lots of positives. Well, let's jump back for a second. Oh, oh, there we go. One person hit neutral. Neutral. Great, great. Okay, we look at the periodic table. Bromine rolls in with seven valence electrons. It's got 35 protons, 35 electrons. Okay, so it's neutral. In order for it to be Br minus, it has to take on one additional valence electron, which we get it to a total of eight dots surrounding this. Okay, so that's where it gets a little bit tricky. If you see something like, and another way to look at this is a negative ion. What does it have to do? It has to gain electrons. A positive ion has to lose electrons. This is a negative ion. So if your default was to draw Br with seven dots around it, and you see this negative charge there, that means you have to have one more electron. Now, here's a follow-up question. And we're not going to do this one as a poll. We'll do one more poll question, I think. Um, how many total electrons are in Br minus? Okay, this, we want to jump back to the periodic table. Br has 35 electrons. Add to the chat, somebody, how many total electrons, not valence, total, does Br minus have? Thirty-six D, correct, correct. Well done. Thirty-six total electrons. Okay. Now, what is a very, I think, a, a useful table to, I would say, look at and, you know, maybe develop like a, almost like a muscle memory of what are the common ions. Well, in things that are in group one, they like to form a plus one ion. Things that are in group two like to form a plus two ion. If we go all the way over here, aluminum likes to form a plus three ion. So what does that mean in terms of gaining or losing electrons? What does aluminum like to do? Does it like to gain or lose electrons? Add that to the chat. Vote for gaining electrons. Remember, an electron has a positive, has a, a negative charge. So if it gains a negative, oh, likes to lose. Christian, perfect. Caitlin, great. It likes to lose electrons. Okay. Now, for those of you who just answered gain, what do these guys like to do? To have a three negative charge, what does it like to do? What do phosphorus and nitrogen like to do? Do they like to gain? They do. They love to gain negative charges, gain electrons. And that's the case for these right here, these right here. So almost as a general rule of thumb, what would you say that, thinking about the organization of the periodic table, what would you say metals like to do? Would you like to say that they gain or lose electrons? Or do they have more of a tendency to gain or lose electrons? Metals. 
lose. That's absolutely right. Metals, the things that are basically on the left-hand side of the periodic table. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a rocking out person with a guitar. This is Metallica. And then here's the hand symbol. There we go, rock or hook of horns, whatever. Um, metals like to lose things on the left-hand side of the periodic table prefer to lose electrons, or they're more likely, not prefer, because it's not really a choice. What about things on the right-hand side of the periodic table with this as my dividing line right here? Do they like to gain or lose electrons? They like to gain. So nonmetals gain, whereas metals lose. Now, I think most of y'all are probably thinking like, okay, well, if metals like to lose electrons and Non-metals like to gain electrons. What about metalloids? And that's a complicated answer. Some of them like to remain neutral. Some of them can gain or lose electrons. They do all sorts of funky things. In particular, silicon does this, or there's a process known as doping. And that's where silicon has kind of a, yeah, different properties. That's what gives silicon different properties. Okay. Does anyone have any questions so far? Well then, I've got one last question. And that is going to be right. Oh, not that one. Back, not pin pull. Watch, here we go. What is the charge of ions formed in group one? The key word in this sentence, in this question, is ions. What is the charge of the ions? Okay, I'm going to give you up until about 35 seconds, then I'm going to call it. And done. Most popular answer? Our most correct response. So what is the charge of the ions formed by group one elements? They like to form plus one ions. They like to lose one electron. And this table right here, I think is a really good representation of things that you should know about the kind of behavior of atoms and ions and electrons. All right, well, that was a lot of information. Um, there are some trends that you should know. There are some kind of rules that you need to know. Gaining or losing electrons, what does that look like? But that's what I wanted to cover today. Um, I'm going to post this PDF and our um, PowerPoint file up on the Canvas page a little bit later today. I'm also going to get our learning objectives for our next exam up before the end of the weekend. Um, but if you've got any questions about anything, like you know, how you did on the exam, if you want to talk about the exam. Remember, I'm going to post a video where I go through that exam question by question, um, hopefully before the end of the weekend. Other than that, I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Or nope, not weekend, because it's Wednesday. I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday and Thursday, and I'll see you again on Friday. Thank you very much for coming to class, everyone.